You are listening to the Brand Architect Podcast, and this is your host, Ani Alexander. Hello, hello there, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Architect Podcast. It's me, Ani Alexander, and as always, thank you so much for tuning in. I truly appreciate your time and attention, and I truly appreciate the fact that you chose to spend the upcoming 40 plus minutes with me. So today we're going to have yet another interview. Today I'm going to talk to Jason Falls. Jason is someone I met on Facebook and what I saw about him in terms of his content, his live streams, what he writes about really provoked thought and made me think that I would really love to have him over to the podcast. Uh, The main point is that he does not uh, feel afraid or ashamed or in any way uh, limited in uh, sharing his unpopular opinions and telling things that many of us don't usually share. And I think that uh, by talking to him, we tackle different topics and talk about stuff that will provoke thought and will make you think a little bit differently around the topic. So um, let's tune in and see what came out of our Facebook Live interview. Today I have a special guest. I'm talking to Jason Falls. So now the ball is on your side. You'll tell us who you are and we'll, we'll take it from there. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm Jason Falls. Uh, so I was in you know, sort of a social media strategist for an advertising agency, worked with a couple of brands for quite some time, uh, and then um, moved into uh, you know a role where I was uh, just a consultant uh, and working with uh, brands, built, built a company and an agency uh, out of Social Media Explorer, which a lot of people I think uh, probably recognize and remember in the space. And um, five years. Um, it's still around as as a blog. The folks at Renegade in New York now own and operate Social Media Explorer. I still do a founder's corner there, but uh, the blog uh, is, is still very successful, still a useful resource for folks, and I'm very proud uh, of that fact. Um, but I uh, just recently started a new company called the Conversation Research Institute, which I'm sure we'll touch on in the course of this discussion where I'm mining online conversations for consumer insights. So long story short, I've been around the industry for 10, 12 years focused on uh, helping clients solve digital problems and understand the social web, probably primarily, but digital marketing as a sort of greater uh, focus for me. And that's kind of what I do. I've written a couple books, speak at conferences from time to time, and um, people tell me I know a thing or two about this space. So I believe them and try to do my best. <laughs> Okay. Well, sounds good. I mean, it's um, it's interesting. You sort of uh, were able to, in a very concise way, tell you know your story in a sense of where you started, what you're doing, and it, it, it's it's not really um, anything dramatic like we we usually hear because we we're told that we have to go through the hero story, right? You you sort of you know <laughs> connect the dots between the lowest point in your life right. towards the the highest successful point of your life and then you share your story and that's how it sounds the best way to to the audience so i really love this balanced approach of of taking it easy and and <laughs> sort of you know being humble and showing it the way it is so that's that's the nice part of it um i also know that uh, I, I actually found out about you we obviously were friends on Facebook and I periodically saw things on my timeline. But uh, the first thing that caught my attention was one of the live streams, which was around controversial topic. Then I sort of looked at your profile. I saw that you've been doing it quite a lot. So it ha- wasn't the first time that you were touching upon a topic and giving a view which was completely different. And obviously, you would predict that not many people would <laughs> eventually agree with you. So uh, is this like something that you enjoy doing or you're doing deliberately? Is there anything behind that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I, I'd like to tell the story of 
building Social Media Explorer as sort of a thought leadership blog in the in the social media space to sort of explain how I you know come to these moments where I I like to call it stirring things up, right? You know, I I am sometimes will take the contrarian standpoint. Sometimes I'll be the devil's advocate and take the opposite viewpoint of of the status quo. Um, sometimes I don't even believe what I'm saying. I'm just saying it to get people thinking and, and <laughs> make sure that they're that they're contemplating the issue more fully. But I tell the story of Social Media Explorer was about two months old or so as a blog. I had just started it. I didn't have any readers, really. I was just trying to build an audience. And I went to a conference in New York City. Uh, that was supposedly focused on social media. This was in 2006, 2007, I believe. 2007. It was fall of 2007. And, um, and I went to this conference, and they spent three days talking about how to game the algorithm on dig.com to get your content <laughs> on the front page so that you can get more traffic to your website. And I, and I walked away from that thinking that conference wasn't about social media at all. It was about cheating. It was about gaming the system to, um, you know, unethically, uh, you know, prioritize your brand's content over someone else's uh, information. And it just, it made me mad. So I went home and wrote a blog post on socialmediaexplorer.com about how the social media elite are basically telling you how to cheat the system. And, and that's bullshit. Um, and I wrote that and published it. And all of a sudden, everybody knew who I was. <laughs> it was <laughs> like all of the, the people who ran the conference at the time came to my blog post and defended themselves and and, you know, commented and opened up a really good discussion about the topic. But my point was, you know, I believe social media to be about building relationships with your customers, about engaging with your customers. It's not about how you can cheat an algorithm to get your content on the front page dig to get more traffic. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, overnight, all of the notable people in the social media space at the time, which was mostly PR folks and SEO folks back then, but, you know, all of the notable, notable people in the space knew who I was. Now, that didn't mean I necessarily knew any more than they did. I, they just knew who I was. But my blog suddenly took off. The readership started to grow. I started to get more attention. And I realized that was my lesson that I, that I sort of created for myself was when you take the opposite perspective and you poke the bear a bit, as it were, and you offer the contrarian standpoint, People perk up and they take note, and it causes people to think the topic through a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. thoroughly so that they come to better conclusions. So my stirring things up, my sort of, um, you know, no nonsense, no BS approach is really about making people think harder about the issue at hand so that they make smarter decisions. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. It's actually... Um we do need such fresh sort of, you know, type of content, which is different because usually when you hear the same thing over and over again, you may end up thinking that that's the only thing out there because you haven't seen anything else. And as you said, thought provoking content is not very, um, you know, diverse and you, you can't find it much these days because often i mean it, it, it's a two-way sword you you can actually you know think about uh knowing what your the audience is looking for and wants and just produce that which ends up by you know having similar type of content all over in, in everywhere uh, or the other way around just you know look at what is not out there and sort of you know educate or, or you know give the other perspective to the audience and give the new fresh look at the same things so i i totally agree i mean these days i don't know about your experience but i have a feeling that people are more inclined to looking for this magic button, shortcut, you know, immediate result type of thing. Uh, even if it's uh, the way it is by cheating the algorithm or, you know, by coming up with several tricks or tactics that do work at this point and not really having this longer vision or not 
really wanting to to know that it takes time and effort and it's a long term stuff and it you know it's there is no such thing as overnight success so um being the person who tells the harsh truth um what are the consequences for that i mean are you getting negative comments or you know what are you getting uh, apart from the attention and new readership and people knowing who you are sure you do get a fair amount of negative when you take the the opposite viewpoint and in today's unfortunately in today's sort of you know everybody uh has a publishing platform and can say what they want which means they will say what they want um you know you you get a lot of people saying things that sometimes are hurtful and and mean spirited as opposed to just a part of the you know civil discourse on mm-hmm. on the the topic so any any time you go to uh, you know share your opinion on social media if you write blog posts if you speak at conferences if you put yourself out there publicly in that way you have to have thick skin you have to understand that you are going to say things from time to time sometimes accidentally sometimes as a mistake but sometimes intentionally you're going to say things that are going to upset folks um, that they're not going to agree with um, I stood up in a meeting in Louisville Kentucky about five or six years ago and the meeting was focused on why is Louisville not able to sort of uh, make headway in being a more you know, technology centered community? Why are we not able to get more investors involved in startups in town, et cetera, et cetera? And I stood up in the meeting and I said, I think quite frankly, the reason that Louisville can't move forward is because we're selfish, because nobody is willing to make a sacrifice for the greater good. Everybody is focused on what's in it for me and how much money can I make. And at some point we have to have someone come to the table to say, we we need to all pitch in for this community to step forward. Oh man, I haven't been able to 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 get earned back um, you know, respect of a half a dozen people who are in the room that day because I called them selfish. But you know what? They were and they are. And I am. You know, I wasn't pointing the finger at them and not me. I was just saying we don't have the mentality as a community to think beyond, you know, how much money this is going to put in our pocket right now. And it's going to take that for the community to move forward. So there are negative consequences and you will have to deal with them. Some of them you'll deal with just fine. You'll be able to shrug them off. Sometimes it's going to have a lasting effect. I'm not a very popular guy uh, in my own hometown in the entrepreneur uh, investor tech community, mm. but I don't care. I don't need to be. It's not an in some game. I don't have to have everybody in town love me in order to be successful. Um, and I think it's it's fair to keep. I, I'll keep reiterating that point from time to time to make people take take a step back and go. Maybe he's right. Maybe there is some selfishness going on here that will, if we get rid of, will help us move forward. I hope so. And you know what? I could be wrong. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe it's not that people in town are selfish. Maybe there's some other reason. But that's my perspective, and I share it, and I stand by what I say. And, you know, I I sometimes have to take the negative consequences with that, and I can't get into, you know, certain parties and dinners and banquets because uh, we don't want him here. He's a contrarian, so let's not invite him. So what? I don't care. Okay, so so let's go back to what I discovered, like the, that video, and uh, because I wanted to to shift the topic towards personal branding and and you know um, brand establishment in general. So uh, so uh, basically, one of uh, the quite well known people in the branding field um, was telling that personal branding is the best way to stand out. And you made a comment, which which actually made me chuckle, basically. <laughs> I don't know why people were so sort of, you know, uh, took it so seriously. But, you know, I, it, it was really a, a good laugh in the afternoon when I read that. So your response was? So my response, his, his uh, it was Carlos Gill and his post was something along the lines of, you know, personal branding helps you stand out so that you, it's not, you're not weird, where's Waldo and people can't find you. And, um, and my response was that he said, personal branding will help you stand out. And I said, so will neon yoga pants, but you're <laughs> going to need more than that. Um, because, and, and the overall point was personal branding is a very effective way 
for you to stand out within your industry or within your community. Um, and the personal branding that I think Carlos is really talking about is, you know, having a blog, carving out a thought leadership position for yourself. And for many people, that is a very effective way uh, to get your name out there, to make sure people know who you are, to stand out in your industry so that if it comes down between you getting a job and someone else getting a job and you stand out more, maybe you'll get that job. But my point was, well, yes, but neon yoga pants also make you stand out just like a personal brand. But that's not all you have to have in order to be successful, because if I'm hiring, um, let's say I'm hiring an accountant. Um, am I going to hire an accountant who uh, shows me that they can do audits, that they can balance you know, my budget, that they can handle you know, financial responsibilities within my company? Um, and that's all they show me. Or am I going to hire the accountant who can do that, but then also can bring attention to themselves online and have blogs and speak at conferences and whatnot? To be honest with you, depending upon the situation, I'm probably going to hire the first one because the other one's distracted by their own image, by creating some magical world where they're king or queen. And I don't want that. I want someone who can run accounting for me. I don't want someone who's going to blog and be all over the place because that's going to distract them from doing their job. So there's this line that you have to balance between promoting yourself and, and having some thought leadership position or at least some presence in your market, but knowing and understanding that if you're using personal branding to get a job, you can't go too far or you're not going to be hireable, right? And so... Um, personal branding for personal branding sake, in my opinion, is, you know, it's, it's the snake oil salesman of today. If all you can sell and all you can show and the only business metric that you can provide is that you know how to sell yourself, but you've got no substance to back that up, that's going to help my business, then you, you're, you have a very thin layer of credibility in my mind. The person who can do a few things to show and illustrate that they know how to use the tools, that they can stand out in, in their industry, that they offer smart you know, information about whatever their expertise is on Twitter and whatnot, but they don't necessarily you know, make it all about them. They're really focused on, I want to go to work for the company and I want to do a good job and this is you know, what I want to focus on. Those are the kind of folks who draw a nice, even balance. And I think sometimes folks like Carlos get a little too enthusiastic about personal branding and don't follow it up with, but you have to realize that you can't go too far because if you go too far, then you're just going to be a personal branding talking head expert person on the internet. And you're actually never going to get hired for the job that you want. Well, actually when you were telling that, I, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, uh, just like you, I I've seen, I I've, I'm friends on Facebook with Carlos and I've seen his posts on the timeline, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, so I know who he is. I know, you know, I I've, I've watched some of his live streams. I know, you know, what he, well, actually that's the problem. I don't know what exactly he does. So <laughs> that is like, I, I, it's, it's, really a personal branding in, in its literal sense mm -hmm. because i know his persona i know the way he looks i know the way we, the way he talks uh you know i know the events he goes to i know who he's friends with more or less like you know you get the impression but i don't know what to approach him for like you right. know what are his services or what is he providing what is right. he doing what is his expertise in which field is his expertise so uh is it a little bit like uh, the wrong angle of personal branding or because i i do think that personal branding per se is not really a bad thing because very often there are people who are creating stuff or who are providing some services, et cetera. And, um, you know, they struggle just because no one knows who the hell they are. Right. So in terms of getting visibility, in terms of that, you know, the bare fact that you exist, maybe those tools are very useful. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's probably a matter of balance, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, and I think to, in, in Carlos's defense, you know, Carlos works for a very large company, uh, I think, as their director of social media, and he doesn't necessarily have to come to his social networks and, and speak on behalf of the company, right? The, what we see about Carlos 
is Carlos trying to be helpful to other professionals uh, who were, you know, in a pl- who are in a place where he once was, where he was trying to, you know, figure out how to be more successful and, you know, you know, grow a presence and whatnot. And he's trying to pass on his experiences and his knowledges from a kind of from a personal, you know, perspective, but also in the professional realm. And you know, his day job, you know, we we don't see that. And I think a lot of times when folks come to the table, and I've you know been accused of this before, and, and am absolutely guilty of it, if I come to the table and criticize someone like Carlos or anyone else who is, you know, basically a social media talking head, a speaker, you know, influencer person in the space, but I don't take time to consider well, in their day job, they're not really allowed to maybe, you know, talk about what they do. There's plenty of people who, like I worked at, I've worked at several agencies and I've worked for several brands over the years and I have non-disclosure agreements. I can't talk about the work that I do with them. So I can come to the internet and say, hey, here's how you write a strategy for a consumer product good and you know, here are all the steps that you need to take. If someone says, well, how do you know this? Why are you credible? I can say, well, I work with clients and brands. And so which ones? Well, I can't always tell them that, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to take into consideration that while someone may appear, uh, you know, to be somewhat superficial in what they provide or uh, or what they do, sometimes it's because they're legally not allowed to say, here's the proof that goes behind that. So in Carlos's defense and in defense of the other, you know, social media guru talking head types out there, which at various points in time, people have said that I'm in that crowd and that's fine. Um, understand that there's there's often a lot more meat behind what they have to offer than you actually see. If you go to LinkedIn and look at the experience that Carlos has, he's worked at several large companies and for several large brands. And, um, you know, he based on the job descriptions and everything else, he's got plenty of of ammunition to go with the advice that he's giving. But and but I, but I also respect the fact that Carlos is spending um, his personal time sharing his knowledge and his enthusiasm for things like Snapchat and emerging platforms and personal branding and so on and so forth. He doesn't necessarily talk about what he's doing for his company, but it's probably by design. It's probably because the company, when he's focused on company stuff, he's working on company stuff. So I I would definitely keep that in mind about folks like that. But sure, there are plenty of people out there. And I was one of these people once upon a time. Um, There are plenty of people out there who follow the fake it till you make it, you know, you know, policy. And when I made I made a career transition uh, about 13, 14 years ago, I was a I was in public relations in college sports in in the United States. And um, I made the transition to the mainstream advertising marketing. Well, when I did that for the first six months, I had no earthly idea if I was even qualified to work in mainstream marketing, PR, advertising. I had a skill set and I thought it might transfer over out of sports, but I was in such a niche industry for a long time that I wasn't sure. Turns out the skills do transfer and I was competent and I had plenty of relevant experience. But for the first six months, I was faking it. I I had no earthly idea what I was doing, whether it was right, wrong or indifferent. Um, Fortunately, I you know, got up to speed pretty quickly, but we all have those moments in time where we are projecting something that we're not in hopes that we'll figure it out along the way. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to, you know, step in it from time to time. You're going to have to take a couple steps back and reset, but that's how we grow. That's how we learn. And so there are people out there who are offering them their services up as a social media expert, social media consultant, social media guru, whatever. Um, and there's people who do it in other industries too. And maybe they don't have the deep resume or the long experience to be able to back up what they assert. That doesn't mean they can't help you. It doesn't mean they don't have something relevant to say. So dig a little deeper uh, before you write folks off. Uh, yeah, definitely. We weren't meant to pinpoint him exactly. It's, it's about pretty much anyone who is very visible in the field and is about personal branding per se. So it's it's not really, I mean, don't take us wrong. It's not really about the person. I personally don't even know him. Uh, so uh, like, you know, I, uh, so absolutely no opinion on that side but um there are two extremes when we're talking about personal branding there are two extreme opinions these days one is about being 
very authentic, which is uh, the most extreme case I can think about is James Altucher, who is completely raw and naked out there talking about absolutely everything, um, which is super uncomfortable to talk about and, and showing whatever is that there the way it is without any censorship at all mm -hmm. about his personal life and, and, and business life and failures and everything else. Uh, the other uh, extreme is the fake it till you make it part of the thing by showing only the nice snippets or exaggerating the the success stories or even making up a customer case studies and stuff like that. I mean, uh, we, we know some people who've done that as well. So, um, I mean, th there are two different arguments on both sides where they justify why this is the right route to go. For a newbie who is just, you know, overwhelmed with all this content and who's just starting to gain, at least is trying to gain visibility online. Um, what should be your advice in this case? Because I'm sure you, you'll come up with something else. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of questions in there, um, and one of one of them I will start out with. I have you know while I you know just admitted to at one point faking it until I make it. I don't think that faking it until you make it means that you lie to people. Um, I don't think that that you can be dishonest uh, in how you approach people these days. I would never advise anyone to fake a case study. I would never advise anyone to, um, you know, to falsify or mislead uh, people into, you know, knowing, um, you know, no, showing what they know and what they can do. Um, now, that being said, I'm a public relations guy by trade and we are typically hired to spin things. So mm -hmm. take someone who has relatively no experience and make it look like they do have experience. So you can say that that's lying. You can say that that's misleading people. Um, I, you know, I've always looked at it as, you know, I'm not telling you an untruth when I say that this person has great enthusiasm and passion for their work and they're a student of the industry. What that might that comes across as very positive, but what that's actually saying, if you read between the lines is they've never worked in the industry. They don't have a lot of experience there. Right. So there there's, you're, you're accentuating the positive rather than, than accentuating the negative. Um, but I think as long as you don't cover up the negative, as long as you don't hide things from people uh, intentionally, I don't think there's anything wrong with sort of, you know, putting a nice positive spin on what it is you do and how you position yourself. Um, so that's sort of one issue. I, I would not, never intentionally recommend being dishonest to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the question of how far do you go, how transparent and open are you, I think that's just a personal decision. I mean, there are lots of people out there who are private people who don't want the world to know about their uh, you know, their personal lives, their family situations, their finances, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other people who are perfectly comfortable sharing it. I will tell you this, the more open you are, the more you share, in general, the more people will trust you, the more people will identify with you. Um, and, you know, James is, is one example that you used. Another example I used is, I'll use is Robert Scoble, who uh, many people who follow him know a couple of years ago, he disclosed the fact that he was uh, sexually abused as a teenager. And that's something that is deeply personal and deeply private and something that you wouldn't normally share with a mass group of people the way he has a huge audience. But he, you do those things for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's liberating for you. It allows you to feel like you're not hiding something that you don't have to be ashamed of something that happened to you that someone did to you. Second of all, it unlocks the ability for people in his audience who have that same experience to feel like they too can stand up and unlock themselves and free themselves from that shame or that guilt. So it's inspirational and, and uplifting as well, but it also shows the world uh, that Robert is much more than just a technology guru. He's more than just a guy that you can uh, trust or look to to understand what the latest gadgets are in the world that you should be looking at. He's someone that has multiple facets to his personality and his life 
Um, and maybe you can identify with the fact that something terrible happened to you when you were a teenager. And it just makes you love Robert all the more that he's able to sort of overcome those obstacles and persevere through and still be uh, the personality that he is today. Um, so that's going to be an individual decision. I don't think everybody is going to be able to share those kinds of secrets and, and, and deal with those types of issues in a public way. And that's OK. You don't have to deal with them in a public way. But if you do, you have a tendency to sort of open up your audience's eyes to, to know that you are much more. Um, than they ever thought. And, and that's almost never a negative. It's always kind of a good thing to, uh, to open that kimono a bit and, and let people really see who you really are and what really makes you tick. It's, it's very endearing. Okay, so it seems like we have a question from David. It says, is content marketing less effective now than it was in the past because there is just so much content being produced these days, millions of blog posts? And I think you mentioned that part briefly, saying that now the barrier to entry is so low, virtually anyone can write anything on different platforms, that uh, that's what's happening, right? right? So what do you think about content marketing these days? I mean, David has a great point there, and, and I think he's right. Content marketing is less effective now than it was, you know, five years ago because there's just simply more, uh, there's more noise out there, which means there's less ability to determine signal. Um, and so Mark Schaefer talks about this in his content shock um, mm -hmm. concept a lot. And, and, and it's, it, it is right. I mean, David's observation there in that question is accurate. There's a lot more noise out there every day and it doesn't get uh, any less noisy. So in order to stand out in a sea of noise like that, your content has to be very special. And the challenge for marketers uh, today is that you have to continually not only one up yourself and create, you know, content that is just insatiable to your audience, but you have to one up your competition. And oftentimes you have to one up the media and everybody else that's fighting for the attention of your audience. And so marketing, especially from a content perspective in today's era, uh, is getting harder and harder and harder. Now, the way that you can combat that isn't always, well, we have to keep coming up with crazy content ideas. Sometimes it's we have to put paid spin behind promoting the content that we do have and using social advertising or using, you know, native advertising and sponsored posts and creative ways to get that content in front of more or different people. Sometimes it's knowing and understanding your audience uh, much more intimately so that you can target better target more specifically so instead of talking to everybody hoping a few people will come to you you target the few people who are most likely to come to you so that you're not wasting the time of all these other folks so there's lots of different ways to kind of slice and dice a solution to that uh, but yes you are going to have to find a way to continually make your content marketing stand out uh, for yourself for your audience against your competition and against the rest of the world that's fighting for the eyeballs of your prospective audience and customers. Um, and you're going to have to continue to find creative ways to deliver that content so that it reach the right, reaches the right people at the right time. So what is a good, I mean, we always tell that, you know, you, you are supposed to create good content, good quality content. What does it really mean? What is good quality? Because it, we end up seeing, we may see uh, better quality content, which is not visible and consumed at all uh, in some lost blog posts or, you know, some people who stopped and gave up and don't produce anything anymore since years. Or we can see something which is sort of average, you know, taken from here and there, shaped in a beautiful way or, or something. And then, as you said, by different tools and tactics and advertising, it just goes viral. So what are the components of a good quality content for you? My, my definition of quality content is the content that delivers, um, you know, value to the audience at that time and in that moment. And so if you are focusing on people who need to know how to change their oil, you know, writing a blog post or doing a video that explains to people how to change the oil in your car, that's not very sexy. Uh, that's not, you know, something that's necessarily going to go viral. You can think of creative ways to execute that. I mean, you can do the video with, you know, crazy cars. You can have celebrity guests. You can, you know, have a comedian telling jokes the whole time. There's lots of ways to kind of pepper it up to make it a lot more fun. But 
ultimately you're delivering that content to the person who is looking for it. So if someone goes to a search engine and types in how to change my oil, you want to hope that the content comes up, that, that, that the content that comes up for them is your content. They click on that link, they watch your video or they read your blog post and it solves their problem. So great content doesn't always have to be loud and funny and obnoxious and sexy. Great content just has to deliver what the ultimate user is looking for, which means you have to have that sort of evergreen nuts and bolts how-to content for whatever it is that you sell or whatever it is that you do. And then you have to have this layer of content that's deeply interesting and thoughtful that really engages the audience on an intellectual level. And then maybe, you know, as icing on the cake, you have content that's funny or viral or super engaging that gets people clicking and talking about you so that you, you know, it's not just about delivering the content. It's also about creating awareness for who you are and what you do. So there's lots of different levels of content, but the true definition of great content is the content that delivers the experience that the user is looking for at that moment. That's a very broad kind of generic answer, but I found it to be true. I mean, if I'm sitting down to write a white paper for a client, and I wrote one not too long ago about internal communications. And so I'm thinking, okay, um, hu human resources, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, managers, uh, operations managers at companies, large companies are going to be you know, looking for this type of information. So I wrote the white paper with those people in mind. Know your audience, write for the audience. Not everybody in the world is going to see that white paper and thinks it's even interesting. They're not even going to download it or look at it. But the people that do, that's who I'm talking to and that's who I'm trying to capture. And the content in that situation needs to be catered for them. Okay, I see. So, so basically here I, I'm just thinking about um, your personal brand, not specifically yours, but someone's personal brand in terms of what he stands out, what the values are, et cetera, et cetera. And then this dilemma of, you know, maybe shifting a little bit the topics or, you know, doing something differently just because that different type, which is not really yours, is more popular and more people will be consuming it. Like there are many people who are making loads of compromises in their content just because they know that it will you know, sort of be consumed better or by more people. So what is it there? Like it, it, it's something like probably having 10,000 followers or having, I don't know, 100 clients or 10 diehard fans or something like that. So what is, what is this uh, thing one should be looking for? How, how far one should go? away from these personal values in order to provide content that is, you know, more popular, so to speak. I think it always, it, it always goes back to knowing who your core audience is, who, who are you ultimately going to serve and how are you going to serve them? Um, and, 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 and which audience are you going to be able to serve and get the return that you want or need out of it, whether it be revenue or, you know, satisfaction that you've provided a good service to people, whatever it is you're in it for. I mean, we're all in it probably to make money from a business perspective at some point, but you really have to define who it is that you serve and what it is that you're going to de deliver to them. I'll give you an example using myself and then someone else sort of similar to me in the space. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk is you know, widely known as being a social media expert, social media guru. He has a Vayner Media. He's a great agency uh, out of New York City that does a fantastic job. Gary is Mr. Personality, but Gary is Mr. Personality on a big scale. He wants to be in front of everybody. He wants all the big businesses in the world to use his agency. He wants all the, you know, the, the little consultant types and the community managers and the marketing managers to, you know, worship the ground he walks on and retweet his quotes and all that good stuff. And he does a fantastic job of it. I've, I've known Gary for a while and, and, and he's just a genuinely good person and genuinely smart. Um, he's a great case study of how to build a personal brand and then build brands from that personal brand to be successful. Mm -hmm. I don't need 
every company in the world to to hire me as a consultant. I don't want or need uh, every single person in the world, in the marketing world, to retweet all my stuff and think that I'm fantastic. In fact, I actually intentionally sat down in October, November of last year and said, you know what, I've been paying lip service all these years uh, to small businesses but I don't actually serve small businesses. I work with medium and large businesses from a consulting standpoint. I'm going to change that. So jasonfalls.com, my blog now has sort of, I've repositioned it to be a small business resource. And I focus most of my content and my in intentions there on helping small businesses solve problems without having to hire a consultant or an agency. I'm trying to coach them a little bit. I'm trying to bring them along and give them ideas on software to use that's not expensive or free ideas that they can execute on that aren't going to be complex and require a lot of staff. So I'm writing things from, a, okay, if I'm a small business and I'm looking at um, CRM or I'm looking at social media management or I'm looking at building a digital strategy, how is, is a small business person going to run through that? And so I've actually sort of focused in on a very narrow audience knowing that it's going to make me feel like I've I've done some good in the world by delivering value to that audience that doesn't normally get that value from other talking head consultant types because the talking head consultant types are all trying to get Cisco and IBM and you know mm -hmm. Apple and everybody to work with them I don't necessarily have to do that in order to be successful so I've kind of fine tuned that so I think that's a good example of the differences. You know, you have to focus in on who your audience is, what you can ultimately deliver to them, and then what you ultimately need to get out of them for it to be worth your while. And once you align that with being able to meet your needs financially and whatnot, then you can ultimately be very successful at what you're doing, and you don't have to be the big viral Gary V success. I see. So we, we said in the beginning that we're going to mention this and t speak a little bit about this and we sort of forgot. So let's go back and talk a little bit about Conversation Research Institute and what it does because sure. we never got into that yet. Um, so what is it about? So Conversation Research Institute um, is basically um, taking social listening to the level of market research. And so most everybody is familiar with the social media monitoring or social listening tools out there that can help you find mentions of your brand so that you can route them to customer service or, you know, respond to them through community management. What we do is we use those tools to collect the data. We go out and find conversations about maybe it's your brand, maybe it's your competitors, or maybe it's just a general topic. Like, for instance, if you are, um, let's say you are Centricon, uh, which is a, uh, a, a termite solution. We're going to go out and find conversations about Centricon. Sure, if you want us to do a brand uh, refresh or a brand audit, but we're also going to go out and find conversations about termites and home improvement and landscaping and all of the things that come into the termite conversation. And what we do with that data is we kind of harvest it. And then instead of relying on the technology which we have been able to show time and time again is not very reliable at at doing analysis we actually have human beings who go through the conversations and score them for topic and sentiment and gender and lots of other things so that the data that you're actually looking at at the end of the day is much more informed much more informative and can give you insights into your uh, into your market so ultimately what we do is instead of going out and finding mentions of your brand and counting things, which is what the social listening software does, it'll say, hey, your brand was mentioned a thousand times and we can slice and dice that and tell you how many men and how many women, da, da, da. So it counts and produces pretty charts and graphs. What we do is we actually get in and analyze. We actually get in and get rid of the stuff that doesn't matter, look for the voice of the consumer, and then tell you, here's what they're talking about, here's why they're talking about it, and here's what you should potentially do about it. So instead of going out and doing a focus group or a survey, which is a traditional research method, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do traditional research, there's value in those approaches as well. What we do is we use social media conversations as our data set, and we go out there and pull in a lot more data that you can get out of a focus group or a survey, go through it and whittle it down to what... Uh, is actually going to be useful for your brand. Very interesting. So 
to to wrap this up, let's put ourselves in the shoes of I know it's been ages, but of a newbie person who's just I don't know how come, but you know, just entering this whole sort of social media and personal branding and content creation, sort of you know, vegan. Um, obviously, I mean, now when I'm trying to imagine uh, that person's position, it's like super overwhelming, loads of content, many people contradicting advice, um, and the problematic uh, aspect of deciding where to start, what to do, you know, where to start from. Um, so if someone is just thinking about the very first step, what one should look for? Wow. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the best thing that you can do as a new person starting out with little to no knowledge in the digital marketing space is really just dive into finding the sources out there that are providing guidance and education in the space that you trust. Now, I can point you to specific ones, but um, what you need to do is find the voices that you trust. There are plenty of people out there who think that Gary Vaynerchuk is the one and only resource, and that's fine. If he works for you and you get inspiration and advice out of him that you can use, great. There are going to be other people who think Carlos Skill is like the bee's knees, and he's the guy that you really have to follow and understand. If he works for you, then follow him. That's great. Um, there are other people who think that, you know, folks like Ann Handley at Marketing Profs and certainly the Marketing Profs library of content is uh, is robust and, and very helpful. So that is a one place I would say you should at least go there and see if you like it. Um, and they have some free content plus some paid content. But what you need to find is you need to find the source uh, for marketing and um, social media and public relations and communications instruction and advice that works for you. My personality is not going to appeal to everyone. Gary V's personality is not going to appeal to everyone. Um, you know, there are people out there who are big fans of John Jantz at Duct Tape Marketing. He does a great job. Uh, and he focuses a lot, kind of like my new focus, he's focused forever on more smaller businesses. So mm -hmm. find the sources that align with what you're trying to do, maybe the industry you're in. There's a, there's a whole subset of people out there who advise and do marketing content just for the legal profession or just for the automotive profession. So, you know, we're talking about the generalists like me and Gary Vee and whatnot. You know, we're talking about across industries. There are people out there who spend their entire lives focused on just one trade and how to market that trade. So find the people that align with what your goals are, what you're trying to do, and, and your personality, how you like to receive information, um, and, and, and just latch on to them. They're going to refer you to other people along the way, and so you can grow your pool of resources. Um, but that's what I would encourage you to do. Good places to start for most people. Marketing profs, great place to start. I've already talked about that. Duct tape marketing, great place to start. Um, social media uh, examiner, uh, Michael Stelzner's resource is really good for kind of broad level social media stuff. I'd be remiss if I didn't recommend Social Media Explorer, which is a blog in the company that I founded. I, I'm not involved in the day to day there anymore, but Drew and his team do a great job with it. Um, there's just there's lots of really good. Re Mari Smith is a fantastic resource if you're really hyper focused on Facebook. So there's lots of great places to start out there. But what you need to do is find the resources that work best for you and your needs and your personality. Those are the ones that are going to be most useful. Thanks a lot for your time, Jason. I really enjoyed our talk. Uh, it was really nice meeting you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Well, that's all that I had for you today. Thank you very much for spending this time with us and listening to the interview. I truly hope that you don't think that the time was wasted and you really enjoyed the interview. I hope it was useful and what I really hope is that it provoked some thoughts and you will go ahead and think about stuff a little bit differently and look at it from a different angle. So that's all that I had for you today. I really hope that you will tune in to the next episodes. I am also thinking about maybe starting a new podcast, but I'll talk to you about that a little bit later once I'm 
more clear about what it's gonna be like and where I would love you to tune in for that. Okay, so that's it. Have a nice weekend and I'll meet you in the next episode. Mm-hmm.